And now I'd like to introduce you to your moderator for today. He is the Director of Global Communications with Echolab, Mr. Roman Blahowski. Mr. Blahowski, you have the floor. Good day, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's food safety webinar. Today's topic is small flies in food service facilities. Our presenter today is Dr. John Barquet. Dr. Barquet is a senior scientist at Ecolab and has a PhD in urban entomology and leads Ecolab Pest Elimination's product evaluation and development. He is an expert on a wide range of pest elimination techniques for food and beverage processing, food service, healthcare, hospitality, and related industries. Dr. Barquet, take it away. Thank you very much, Roman, and welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining, and uh, what we're going to do today is we're going to be talking about small flies, and these are uh, uh, basically insects uh, that can be uh, breeding within your facility. In April, we talked to you uh, in our food safety webinar about large flies, or filth flies, and just to distinguish the difference other than their size, uh, the filth flies, uh, such as the house fly, uh, they tend to breed outdoors, and uh, they rarely breed indoors simply because of the, uh, their biology and habits and the fact that we change our garbage on a weekly basis at least. Now, these small flies are more problematic in that they can breed indoors, and they're actually quite common. Uh, and today we're seeing one, of these, one or more of these species breeding in uh, food service establishments, uh, about 60% or so. Uh, of restaurants today are experiencing uh, or have experienced uh, some sort of problem with small flies. Uh, they are a food safety issue and we'll talk about that. And uh, they can be a very important issue to your business and to your brand. So we're going to talk about what it is that we can do together to, uh, to work uh, against small flies. So what I'd like for you to walk away with today is understanding the basics first of the small flies their biology and behavior, uh, why are they present within your facilities. Uh, we'll cover off on the food safety considerations, uh, why would they be important not just from the standpoint of a nuisance within your facility, but also the potential to uh, uh, be involved with uh, foodborne pathogens and things like that. And then discuss, again, why are they there, the, the conducive conditions and what we need to do to uh, prevent them and take care of them if the infestation happens to uh, be there. So as, uh, as we've discussed, uh, if you have questions that come up, uh, please go ahead and submit those as they do come up, and then I'll be happy to take questions at the end, and there'll be plenty of time to review those. Okay, we're going to talk about four basic species that are most going to be most common breeding within the facilities. Uh, the fruit fly is by far probably the most problematic for some of you. Uh, we're not talking about the agricultural fruit fly pests, uh, things such as the Mediterranean fruit fly, which some of you on the West Coast might be familiar with. Uh, this is an indoor breeding species of Drosophila, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Ford flies, uh, also important, tend to breed in more stagnant conditions than fruit flies. Uh, that's the same that's true for moth flies. And then fungus gnats, which are a little less common, but uh, they are associated with moist conditions. All of these are capable of breeding both indoors and outdoors. And unlike the filth flies, they can be year-round pests. They're not necessarily seasonal. We do see uh, populations reduced in the wintertime, especially in the northern states. We'll talk a little bit about why that is. Uh, but they're all associated with something somewhere is fermenting. And it doesn't have to be a very large spot. It can be very uh, contained, as some of you probably get frustrated as to where these flies are coming from. So we'll talk about that. It can be very hidden conditions as to where they're, they're, they're breeding. And uh, they are capable of picking up uh, things such as pathogens and moving them around to food and food handling surfaces. So in many ways, they're just as important as the uh, so-called filth flies. And very common in food service and other food handling facilities, including uh, food and bottling plants. So it's something that uh, is, is out there. They've got very huge reproduction potential in terms of uh, the number of eggs that a female can, can lay and how quickly a population can grow within the facility. 
So we'll get into more specifics about each of these. Okay, first of all, let's talk about the fruit fly. And again, this is going to be a, a species of Drosophila. We've got a couple of species that are important. One is Drosophila melanogaster. That is more the red-eyed fruit fly, which is not pictured here. What we show here is more of a dark-eyed species, which is larger than the Drosophila uh, melanogaster. Those tend to stay more around recycling. Uh, you'll probably see them in your trash areas from time to time. They tend to stay a little closer to the source of infestation. The larger species uh, that, that's present here, they're about one-eighth of an inch in size, so that's almost twice as large as the red-eyed fruit fly, and they're much more mobile. They, uh, they can be breeding far away from where you actually see them. They're attracted to certain areas during the day. We'll talk about their basic behaviors and how it changes during the day, but uh, their areas where they breed is not necessarily where you're seeing them in your establishment, so they, they, they're capable of flying quite a bit of a distance from, from where they are breeding, unlike the red-eyed fruit fly, which tends to stay close. Uh, they're more tan and yellowish in color, and if you've seen them, uh, you know that they can be associated with your produce, your vegetarian, decaying organic matter too, as it gets to, uh, uh, thrown onto the floor in places during normal operations, uh, and uh, they can breed in, in drains. Now, it should be understood that we talk about drains uh, many of us think that drains are the primary source. It's not necessarily the case. We'll show all of the different possibilities of where these flies can be breeding. So it's not just restricted to the drains. And they come into your facility through produce. They can come in uh, with materials that are basically coming in the back of the house with your supplies. And they can also be coming in from the exterior, especially in warmer climates. Uh, they're, they're very common, for instance, in Hawaii outdoors and very capable of coming inside uh, and, and producing problems within the facility. Females lay a lot of eggs in their lifetime. Uh, they lay about 500 eggs, so you can imagine uh, in a very short period of time there can be a large, large problem with fruit flies. And the life cycle uh, from egg to adult is 8 to 10 days. And I'll show you what I mean by the life cycle, but it's essentially going from the egg, the larva, the pupa to the adult stage. And that takes only about 10 days. And then the fly themselves, once they reach that adult stage, only live about two weeks. So they're not long-lived, but that's plenty of time for them to reproduce and, and lay eggs in, uh, in areas that are conducive to them. Second, let's talk about the forward fly. It's also called the humpback fly, also called the scuttle fly because of the way that it moves around. It doesn't fly around nearly as easily as the fruit fly does. And uh, they vary in size. There's different species, so about 1 64th to a quarter of an inch in size. They tend to be darker, uh, black, black uh, brown, or, or, or a little yellowish in color. And they have a very characteristic humpbacked appearance. Now, you will need, uh, if you're interested or ever get interested, uh, what your pest management provider will oftentimes have is a hand lens, and they can look at these under magnification. So it's a little difficult to see them in actual size, these features that I'm talking about. But under magnification, it's pretty obvious. They breed in uh, moist, uh, decaying organic matter, very common in dirty drains. Uh, they're also associated with broken sewer lines. Uh, so they, they do like more sewage, if you will, like conditions. I have to warn you, this is an excellent subject to talk about over lunch. Uh, but it's, uh, it's something that uh, we need to talk about because they do get into these very dirty uh, uh, situations, stagnant water, dirty mop heads, and they can come in through the building exterior, or as I mentioned, they're associated with broken sewer lines, and if that happens, that's happening under the slab, and these, these four flies tend to come up through expansion joints, and when you see that happening, if they're coming out of wall voids and places like that, there's probably a serious moisture issue or a sewer line break, both of which are expensive to take care of. They're structural in nature, and those do need to be uh, repaired uh, by a professional. So there's some things that we can't have our cleaning staff take care of in the restaurant. Rather, we have to bring in a contractor for them to make, uh, make repairs. And then, uh, again, very high breeding potential. Each female lays up to about 750 eggs. And their life cycle is a little bit slower than the fruit fly, 21 to 28 days. 
Now the moth fly obviously gets its name because it looks like a little moth. They're about 1 16th, 1 16th to 3 16th inches in size and uh, they are very common in drains just like the forward fly pale yellow to brownish gray and they do have a very delicate and fuzzy appearance you're not likely to see these out in your dining room areas in your customer areas which is good news they tend to stay very very close to the source of infestation which more commonly is the dirty drain or sump pumps places like that uh, grease traps they can be in those areas as well uh, a little slower breeding potential than the other species we've talked about. Females lay about 100 eggs in their lifetime, and their life cycle var varies from 7 to 28 days. And then probably the least frequent that you deal with, but, but some of us do, especially if you have potted plants or interior plantscapes within your facilities, so live plantings, uh, you can have fungus gnats. And they're strictly uh, a soil-based pest. They don't really like sewer-like conditions. They're not very common coming out of drains. More, more likely they're associated with some sort of plant that you have within your facility. And uh, different species, so they vary from about 1 32nd to, to 7 16 of an inch. Very slender shape, as you see in the picture there. Uh, generally they are black in color, and they feed on fungi in the moist soil, so that's their food source and often associated with those potted plants or interior plantscapes, especially if you overwater those or keep them over, uh, over irrigated. And they can come in from the outdoors as well because they're common soil pests or, or soil insects rather outside. And they're not really considered a health threat uh, because their breeding and feeding is not in as unsanitary conditions as the other species that we've just covered. Not very much known about their biology, simply because people just don't think they're as important. Uh, they really don't cause any damage other than being a nuisance. Uh, life cycle is about 10 days. So in food service facilities, all of these are important, and they can get into other environments, such as healthcare environments, where they become even more of an issue, especially in surgical wards, places like that. So they're important uh, to other aspects of uh, commercial industry. But we're going to focus on the food service here, kitchens in particular, because that's where we most commonly are going to encounter where these flies are breeding. Now, just to talk about what we mean by life cycle, and this is true for uh, insects uh, of all types, they go through a different type of life cycle. In this case, they're flies, and they are true flies in the order Diptera. So they have uh, four life stages, the egg, uh, which are very tiny, very difficult to see, and these are going to be laid in the uh, particular material that they like to breed in. So whether it be the uh, sugar snakes and such that you can find in drains, we'll talk about sugar snakes and biofilms that these flies like to take advantage of. And then the egg will hatch into a larva, it's also called a maggot, and that molts several times uh, until it goes to the pupa stage, or puparium, and that is a dormant stage uh, that will eventually the adult fly will emerge from and then they're capable of mating and reproducing within the facility. So they all go through this. It can really vary. We have eight to ten days there. Uh, that's for the fruit fly, but as we've talked about for the other species, uh, this can vary quite a bit. Okay, and uh, they are common in food service uh, facilities. They can be year-round. Uh, they generally do prefer the warmer temperatures, so the warmer the floor temperature, especially when you think uh, many of these flies are breeding down low. We can get them breeding up in equipment, such as beverage dispensing equipment, uh, or Hobart mixers, uh, but they tend to be more at the floor level, and the, many of these areas can be hidden. And so the floor temperature can be critical. When that temperature gets below 55 degrees Fahrenheit, they are having a tough, tough, tough time breeding, and that can happen to kitchen floors easily in the northern, northern uh, climates. And that's why we do see in those northern climates the populations reducing in the wintertime, maybe not completely, but noticeably, uh, whereas in the southern states, the southern tier, the southern smile of the U.S., if you will, the, uh, the flies can occur much more commonly year-round. And then... Uh, uh, the temperatures that they do prefer are above 70 degrees Fahrenheit. They can, they can dial the phone, if you will. That's where they, they prefer to be. Now, they are uh, quite capable of transferring pathogens. 
and other, other items that they, uh, they happen to land on. And what we've got uh, here is basically a petri dish shown after uh, fruit fly has been exposed to the uh, auger, just a general auger plate. And uh, they, because they're breeding in these areas, the trash receptacles, uh, they are capable of breeding in feces. That would be more the filth flies coming in from the outside. Dirty drains, stagnant standing water, stagnant mop heads, as we've talked about. Uh, there's, been, there's been studies, uh, and you maybe heard this from some of your uh, other food safety courses and such, that mop heads can be a source of pathogens, and they've been sampled and, and been found to have a variety of things, even including listeria that are capable of uh, being on those. So it's very important to keep your, your, your mop heads and, and other areas in good, uh, good sanitation order. They rest away from breeding sites. That's important to understand. They're going to be carrying these uh, organisms that they pick up in the breeding sites and moving them to places, possibly food handling surfaces. Uh, they do like to rest at higher sites during the day. Uh, and in the morning is when they are most active looking for food and mating. So it's right when you turn on the lights, when you come in in the morning uh, shift to get things started, you probably notice these flies buzzing around a little bit more, and then during the day you see them reside uh, higher up, resting in areas, and this is especially true for the fruit fly. They have uh, body parts that are capable, very capable of transporting these materials. Uh, I'll show you some illustrations here. Uh, but they have uh, sponging mouth parts, and when they land on surfaces, they, they, they lap up this material, and then they will basically season any other surface they land on uh, with materials that they've been feeding on or resting on. And then they can leave uh, other spots, too, from their fecal or their, their mouth spots uh, as they, they walk and feed and fly around the facility. So they have a potential to spread disease. Um, they've uh, uh, They've been, they've been shown to be able to carry these materials that have not been demonstrated. There's been no, no actual direct linkage uh, that we know of, but today uh, two small flies and foodborne illness, but we can easily deduce that they do that. Uh, there are other pests in your facility where it has been scientifically proven that they're linked to a foodborne outbreak, uh, such as the house fly or the uh, uh, Norway rat, uh, roof rat, uh, have, been, have been linked to pathogens in, in food service facilities. So here is the anatomy of the fruit fly, basically showing where, where, these, uh, where these pests are basically capable of picking up uh, pathogens, and it's mechanical transmission. It's not that they're feeding on them and, and transferring them uh, through a reproductive uh, state such as mosquitoes might do. Rather, it's mechanical on the outside of their bodies and they've got the potential to transmit these through their activities. And uh, uh, basically we're talking about mostly bacteria, uh, possibly some fungal organisms, but, but mostly bacterial, bacterial organisms are what, what we tend to be worried about when we talk about foodborne illness. So we talked about the mouth part. It is a sponging mouth part. And they've got all sorts of cavities within those mouth parts to be able to pick up and hold on to uh, food particles as well as any bacteria or other pathogens that might, uh, might come along with it. And what they do when they land, now this is fly spec, and uh, this is on a uh, drop ceiling, and you can see that they, these markings here are where the fruit flies are, are resting during the day, and they will drop off and they'll make fly spec uh, as they rest in these areas. So this is a, one of the signs symptoms of a very large fruit fly infestation uh, that's either currently present or was present at one time. Uh, this is a picture of E. coli uh, in the mouth part of a uh, house fly, and uh, we can imagine we see the same thing. Uh, fruit fly mouth parts are a little bit more difficult to photograph in a scanning electron microscope, which is what you see here, but uh, this shows a pathogenic form of E. coli, the 157H7. Uh, uh, present within the, within the house fly. So very much uh, insects such as flies are capable of carrying these things around, especially, you know, possibly in very large numbers is what you see here. Now this is the foot of the fruit fly. Uh, what you see at the top looks kind of like a strange looking mustache, if you will. Uh, uh, that is the tarsal claw of the fruit fly. 
and it does have some material on there. Uh, we, uh, uh, we do experiment with things such as fluorescent dyes and such with these flies just to see how capable they are in transferring these materials around, and you do see some of the remnant of that on the tarsal claw. The claw allows them to climb very smooth surfaces, or excuse me, very rough surfaces, uh, so things such as painted, painted wood, uh, they're very capable of hanging on to that. Uh, below that is an organ called the pulvillus. And I'll, I'll show you a little closer picture of this, but this is what allows them to land onto more smooth surfaces such as glass. And this is just a different orientation of the foot uh, or the tarsus uh, uh, pointed downward. So you can see the claws to the side and then the pulvillus down on the bottom, the sticky pads. And just moving in closer to the pulvillus, we have the tenet CT, which are basically filaments that at the very end have a very sticky residue. And this allows them to cling to smooth surfaces and also have potential to transfer materials around. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you a video. And uh, bear with me here. I will go to my desktop. And what I want to show you here is, and this may be a little jerky for some of you, but uh, bear with me because it's not important that you see it absolutely at real time. What I'm trying to show here, this is a fruit fly video, and uh, it's magnified, obviously. And we have put some fluorescent dust on this fruit fly, and they don't like to get anything on them. They're very irritated uh, by getting any sort of material. so. What they will do is they tend to groom away from the breeding source because these are dirty environments and they're picking all sorts of material up that they want to groom off. So as part of that, they will fly away from that breeding area and land on more of a clean surface and then they'll groom this material off. And what you can see with this fruit fly, they're very thorough in their grooming behavior, starting out with the front legs. Then they move towards the back of the body. So they're trying to remove every bit of material and uh, what you might see are, is some of that material coming off and being deposited at the surface. And now he's doing the uh, rear legs right now. And then they'll clean off under the wings and so it's very thorough. I won't make you go through the whole video here. Rather what I'll do is I'll, I'll go to the end and just finish. And then what you can see is the fruit fly is going to walk off stage now. and. Uh, and then what we'll see is what that fruit fly has left behind in terms of the residue. And we're going to turn on a black light here. Turn on the black light and you can see that orange glowing material. That is the dye that that fruit fly has uh, left off. So that demonstrates quite clearly how capable they are in moving this material around. So it could be the same for a pathogen. It could be the same for uh, something like a bacteria or fungi in these environments, which which we, of course, uh, is something that we want, want to avoid. So not just nuisance pests, but they're also, uh, they're also considered to be a, a food safety risk. So pictured on the left here is probably what some of you see. Now, it's a very bad fruit fly infestation in this case. Uh, you've got these uh, dark spots that are representative of where the flies are resting during the day. On the right is uh, what's called a biofilm. That's the shiny surface there. And then the white, uh, those white organisms there are actually the maggots. So this is going to be in a drain area. It could be a drain line. It could even be a, a floor tile crack with stagnant water in it. That's going to be the source of the fly. And it tends to be well removed from where you see the adults resting during the day. That's what's tricky. Where you see the flies during the day is not necessarily a clue as to where exactly they are breeding. So it does take a good inspection process to be able to uh, figure out, figure that out. So does this look familiar to any of you that happen to have bars? You think this, uh, just ask yourself, would this bar have potential for fruit flies? Uh, for those of us that work in these environments on a regular basis, you probably get familiar with a certain smell. And there is a certain odor associated with, uh, with these flies, uh, where they're breeding. They like very yeasty materials, so they love beer and beer where it's dripping and leaking down into voids, uh, into, the, into the trough. 
this, this is an older facility. You can tell the, the floor tiles uh, breaking down. We've got corrosion around uh, under, under the beer tap there where the, uh, the drain is. And you can see the, the copper or the uh, material there is, is corroding. Under that is probably a very large source for fruit flies where these fluids are, are seeping. They get in under countertops, they get into voids, and then they ferment. And the fruit flies and forward flies are very good at finding these, these areas and then uh, breeding in very large numbers. And they can be very hidden, very recessed, and uh, we, we have the common practices at night of covering the, uh, uh, not just the taps, but also the, uh, the liquor bottles to make sure the fruit flies and such are not going to get inside them. So many of you are used to de dealing with these flies on a daily basis. Highly attracted to alcohol, highly attracted to yeast-based materials and anything fermenting. Uh, any vegetable matter that happens to be kicked onto the floor and is left for a day or two can be a primary source for these flies. So this is an older facility. It needs uh, not just uh, to be cleaned, but it, it looks like it's in need of some structural repair. So you've probably uh, uh, been in some of these environments yourselves. Uh, this is a cook line uh, for which uh, the uh, cooking staff uh, tends to cook, or excuse me, drop uh, uh, things while they're cooking. And as a convenience, they just kick it under the uh, cook line to get it out of the way. And in this case, it, it accumulated. This was one of the rare occasions where we saw house flies and uh, blow flies breeding indoors. It's very uncommon to see that. So this garbage has been staying under that cook line for at least a week without being addressed. It takes, it takes that much time for the, uh, for the uh, house flies and especially the, the blow flies to find, find these. But fruit flies can breed in this material as well especially if it's vegetable matter, such as uh, uh, potatoes and such that are getting kicked under there. So it's very important to keep this, this clean. And I've got a checklist for you at the end of things that should be done. But this needs to be addressed not just for the sake of small flies, but cockroaches and rodents will also take advantage of these situations. And as many of you know, produce. They love onions, they love bananas, they love fruit, uh, and it doesn't have to be rancid necessarily for them to be uh, breeding within those. A uh, very short period of time, uh, they can begin laying their eggs. The eggs themselves are not a health threat, uh, but uh, certainly what the adults carry with them uh, can be. And uh, believe it or not, many of us have eaten our fair share of fruit fly eggs in our lifetime. Uh, they're very common. And uh, again, they don't pose a health threat, but the reality is, is they're there. So this is a major source, bringing them into the facility. Uh, all your produce should be covered. Don't, uh, don't leave it exposed to the open air. Uh, good pr common practice is to keep uh, the onions and any other vegetable matter uh, covered during the day. And have a good uh, first in, first out uh, inventory program so that you are keeping fresh produce as much as possible. As more time goes on, the flies are quite, quite capable of producing large numbers in these uh, in, in onions and other materials. And uh, best practices in terms of garbage storage. Uh, looks like this garbage is not being emptied frequently enough. Uh, the outdoor dumpster area can be a source as well, but obviously this is indoor storage, so this is worst case scenario in terms of. We can't really access this to ter determine exactly where the flies are breeding, but uh, you can bet that some of these bags are broken and the flies are capable of getting in there. In this particular facility, there were thousands of fruit flies in this area alone, so we can consider this to be a very major source of where they are breeding. And, and on the left there is one of those trash cans with the bags removed. And look at the spillage that you have in the bottom of that trash can. Uh, that is ripe with small fly larvae and breeding. Uh, many facilities like to make banana bread, so they will let the bananas sit out and oxidize so they get dark and, and more easy to cook with. That's good, but they should not be exposed as they are in this picture. We, we're going to have fruit flies laying their eggs in this, and you can't see it. You won't be able to, you know, it won't be obvious to you other than there'll be fruit flies on the bananas. But uh, they will be laying their eggs and reproducing in this over time. Depends on how long you keep your bananas to make uh, banana bread. An obvious source down in the lower left are the dirty drains. In the center left, uh, in the lower center photo, that is 
uh, that white material is a sugar snake that was blown out of a drain line above it. So what we did was we put some pressure, some water pressure to that drain line above and then expelled the sugar snake. Sugar snakes are a form of biofilm that is produced by a bacteria and it is a nutritional source for the fruit flies as well as a protective layer. They're very protected against these. Uh, some facility managers like to put bleach down their drains. Bleach is completely ineffective in controlling small flies and I'm going to tell you why. It's because they will recede into these sugar snakes and be protected from the bleach. And the bleach does not do a good enough job of killing the sugar snakes outright. You need to clean those drains out and use uh, even quat sanitizers. Uh, uh, those of you familiar with sanitizers, true sanitizers, to clean those out. Bleach is not the best material to be putting down your drains, and it's from a safety standpoint as well. It's quite toxic material and there are better cleaning solutions for drains and also for the safety of your employees, there's better chemistry options. On the lower right picture uh, is where the mop storage is. This can be a very common area where the small flies are breeding. Forward flies, the humpbacked flies or scuttle flies like to breed in these areas. Uh, stagnant rags, if you keep your rags for cleaning and you put them into a container and those aren't cleaned on a regular basis, they can be a perfect source for small flies breeding within your facility. This is a beer cap drain, and rearing its ugly head there is a red-eyed fruit fly. You can just see the top of its, its uh, head there. And I'll just point it out to you, it's right here. I just blotched it out, but it, uh, it, it is um, uh, coming from this material that's basically uh, down here. You can see it. Uh, breeding down here, uh, and that is the material that is uh, basically the, the sugar snake that the fruit flies are attracted to. So right down in that beer drain is where, uh, uh, you, again, you can have these, these flies uh, emerging. Okay, more conducive conditions. The, the beverage lines. Now, beverage lines, obviously, most of them contain uh, you know, either your beer or your very sweet pop materials with sugar in them. Uh, the flies love these materials especially where you have leaky beverage lines. And then what we have here on the upper left picture is a mass of fungus. That blue material is a fungus growing below a leaky beverage line and right above that is a huge mass of fly pupa. And so you've got thousands of fruit flies breeding in these beverage lines. This is quite a hidden area so it's not obvious and it's not an obvious area that uh, you would have your staff clean. So not, not something that you would typically expect to have to, to do, but you do need to keep an eye and make sure that your equipment is in good repair. In the upper right is a garbage disposal. And the fruit flies, there's leaky areas in this equipment, especially as it ages, and you will get the uh, fluids and materials seeping into cracks and crevices around this equipment that the flies will be attracted to and they will lay their eggs. Again, the equipment needs to be kept in good repair. And then pictured here is a holster uh, for uh, holding the uh, beverage dispenser. And you can see, uh, a little difficult to see here, but there are fly pupa in the bottom of that beverage holder. And then in the lower right, we've got uh, opened up, we opened up a beverage dispenser. And down in the bottom, we have a clogged drain. And we've got some fluid that's accumulating there and the flies will take advantage of that. They find their way into the equipment. So again, not an obvious place for the staff to clean on a regular basis, but if you open up the equipment, you'll see that it, it gets uh, filthy and, and should be cleaned in, on at least a weekly basis. There's a close-up picture of uh, fly pupa on a leaky beverage line, and uh, again, it doesn't take very much for these flies to breed in very large numbers. Also, equipment, leaking equipment, uh, dishwashers. Dishwashers oftentimes begin to leak and sometimes very large amounts of water. Uh, this will cause stagnant water on the floor. It will also break down your grout. Here's a uh, perfect example of a restaurant before the flood in New Orleans uh, along the French Quarter. And uh, we've got uh, a lot of high-end restaurants there, but uh, they're busy all day, 24-hour facilities, many of them. 
So cleaning is a real challenge in a 24-hour facility. So for those of you that have facilities that are 24 hours, I, I understand uh, the difficulty here. Uh, but here when you get standing water, standing for a long time, the, the grout will break down and then you have the water accumulating in there or as in the lower left picture, you get it going in behind the baseboards and into the wall voids. And this is very conducive to forward flies and can be very difficult to address. You can't access where these flies are breeding. So these are actual structural problems, equipment problems that need to be addressed. Uh, you may have to get contractors in. Chances are your pest management provider will not be able to provide this type of service. Uh, this is, this is, these repairs are too difficult. Minor things they might be able to do for you, such as sealing the occasional gap or hole, but when it comes to this type of repair, it's very serious and it needs to be handled uh, with industrial materials, uh, things that are approved by food code for construction within restaurants, uh, and if it's a food processing facility, the rules get even, get even tighter. So keep the, keep the facility in good repair, repair as best you can. And this is just an example of standing water in a facility probably familiar to many of you, operations during the day, you're very busy and uh, you know you can't take the time necessary to make repairs right away, but do the best you can uh, in the off hours to, to make these repairs. So this is a picture of a forward fly uh, on, on glue board. So the, the forward flies have been captured on a glue board and they're coming out of a vent and this vent is originating from under a slab. And what's happening is right beneath that slab there is a broken sewer line. So if you see a situation like this, uh, it can be an indication of a broken sewer line, which in that case you have to get a plumber to come in uh, and help to replace that line along with it being excavated. Very expensive operation, but there's no other way to solve this problem long term. Your pest management provider can put up fly lights, which will capture these flies during the day and and try to reduce their numbers, but it's not practical to expect that to, uh, to solve the problem. Another thing that we see with forward flies is with high water tables. So for example, in the state of Florida, uh, many people don't have basements in the state of Florida because the water table is so high, and sometimes it gets so high that the water begins seeping into the building from the surrounding area and can get into the wall voids that way. So we see the fluid uh, the fluids coming in from the outside producing these fly uh, type problems. Your pest management provider will not be able to help you with that other than just doing some rudiment rudimentary uh, uh, capture of the flies. Rather, you're going to have to get that sealed and again, it's a very expensive operation. So let's talk about uh, what it is that we'll, what we can do. And one of the obvious things is cleaning drains weekly and uh, we recommend at least weekly and knowing that you're going to have a little difficulty in accessing some of these drains. Uh, some of them are, are built over such that you have difficulty accessing them, but do the best you can. Use a stiff long handled brush. Get rid of that organic material. If there's a lot of organic load in there every day, that should be removed. And use a snake-like device if it's clogged. And we talked about the broken pipe under the slab. That would, that would have to be repaired. So just pouring bleach down the drain doesn't work. There are some enzymatic drain cleaners that you can put down every day, especially if the organic load is not too high. But if you've got a lot of soil going down there every day or a lot of vegetable matter, those will have to be cleaned physically rather than trying to rely on chemistry alone to clean those drains. And of course, clean up that food debris under the cook line and if you're using a power washer, be very, very careful with power washing floors. They can damage the floors, they can break down the grout, and they can actually move soil to other areas where it wasn't a problem. They can actually blast the dirt to other locations. So if you're using a power washer, uh, be mindful of that. Rather, we recommend a stiff brush and a good mop to remove the, uh, the soil that happens to be on, on uh, kitchen floors. And then follow these good housekeeping practices. Uh, store produce under refrigeration whenever possible. Um, and then we talked about the onions, potatoes, other perishables. Make sure they're in plastic tubs and well covered. Clean garbage containers daily and use plastic liners. Make sure that garbage is being removed on a, on a good basis so you don't have overflow. 
and inspect underneath loading docks if you have them in your facility. If you've got a large hotel kitchen or something like that, uh, you're going to have a dock area. Clean out any spillage there. We talked about the rags and the mop heads. Keep those clean before storing. And regularly inspect and repair cracks and flooring to prevent seepage below. We want to keep that grout in good condition, the tile repaired uh, whenever they break. And uh, repair the plumbing, drain problems immediately so you don't get standing water. And for your windows, if the flies happen to be coming in from the outside, you're going to want to have at least 16 mesh screen or smaller uh, size to keep the flies from getting in. And then keep the exterior dumpster pad free of spillage and debris and keep doors to the exterior closed as much as possible. And that's true for all of your pests that come in from the outside, possibly including house flies and rodents, cockroaches if you live in the southern U.S. And avoid overwintering, overwatering your plants or irrigation of your plantscapes, and that would apply to the fungus gnats. So partner with a licensed uh, pest management provider. Uh, we don't recommend that you apply pesticides yourself uh, because the pesticides that are going to be approved for use against these flies generally have to be applied by a professional. They need to be labeled for a food handling environment. Many insecticides that you can buy uh, in the lawn and garden, or for instance, will not be labeled for use in food handling facilities. Plus, I don't think you want your staff handling insecticides. So partner with a good, reputable pest management provider. They will work with you on your pest program, starting on the outside of the facility, doing our best to exclude the pests in the first place, and then they will help you discover where the pests are breeding. They all need food, water, and harborage. Where is that? Uh, and so that you can solve this problem together. It's a partnership, and it has to be. So make sure you've got doors open, uh, especially long term. There may be uh, air door uh, possibilities for putting equipment and such there to keep the air pressure positive coming from the building. There are strip doors and such that can be used uh, to help the turf flies from getting into your facility. Light traps, there's all kinds available that your pest management provider can, can, can give you either in the form of a service where they install it and service it or they sell it to you and the glue boards uh, should be replaced regularly. There's the electronic zapping uh, fly lights that can be used on the outside of the facility. Generally these are not recommended for in the back of the house because of their ability to spread the fly pathogens as they zap the flies. So better to use glue board type fly lights that use the ultraviolet light to attract the flies and then capture them on the glue board. This is not a long-term solution. It's part of the solution. It helps to monitor for the flies as well as does provide some population reduction but ultimately we need to find the source and eliminate that. There are wall sconce units available as well as those that direct the light uh, uh, forward. So what your pest management provider can do is conduct a thorough inspection and they will determine what species are present. That's very important to know po probably where they're coming from. Uh, do our, they, they need to, to find where the flies are coming from. Easier said than done, you've probably figured it out by now. And uh, then they can treat. There are certain products that are approved for use. Uh, there's different types of insecticides that can be used that maybe interrupt the life stage of the uh, fruit fly at various points and others that kill the adults uh, after they emerge. So you've got to partner with them to do that. Again, we don't recommend that the, that the facility staff be involved with any insecticide application. So at this point, I'd like to open it up for questions. So Roman, if you uh, wouldn't mind helping me with that, I'd be happy to take your questions. Sure, we've had several questions come through. Um, first one here, how long can a fruit fly live? Well, fruit flies are, are short-lived, short and generally all the small flies are about two weeks or so max. Same for fill flies. Once they reach the adult stage, their only duty in life is to mate and then reproduce. So they mate, and then the female lays their eggs, and, uh, and so about two weeks is all they need for that. And you did touch on this a, a bit earlier in the presentation, but I'll ask the question, are there any good insecticide products that a restaurant should be using to help eliminate fruit flies? Yeah, and you've probably gone online, and you probably see all sorts of things out there. Many of the insecticides that are available to homeowners and the non-professional are contact only. 
They tend to be essential oil-based or materials that will kill the flies on contact but provide no residual control. And many of them, uh, their, their performance has not been proven, but they're also not labeled to be used in food handling facilities or maybe when a facility is, is within operation. So there are insecticides that are effective. Most of those are available to the professional pest management uh, industry only because it requires a license or certification to, require, uh, to apply. Uh, and we just don't recommend that facility staff make those applications. Now, there are materials that can be purchased for mitigating the conducive conditions in drains, such as certain products, enzymatic cleaners, that can be put down into drains on a daily basis to help reduce the breeding potential for these flies. Those are really not technically insecticides. Those are more of a cleaning material that uh, continue to clean and remove the breeding source of the fruit flies. So they're not killing the fruit flies directly, but rather removing their breeding source. So, so those are fine. I don't have a problem with with uh, you using those, but try and leave the uh, pesticide application up to your pest management provider. Great. If, if bleach is not an effective product for cleaning drains, uh, are, uh, what would be examples of products that may be effective in, in helping to keep a drain clean? Yeah, I'm really, really, excuse me, bleach is not really a cleaner. Bleach is more of a disinfectant. So bleach works after you've cleaned a surface. So it's good for uh, removing viruses and mold and and fungi, anything that might be there after you've cleaned it. But in order to clean a drain, you need to use an industrial drain cleaner. There's lots of different ones available. Some of them are more caustic than others, so you need to, there can be some safety issues with those as well, especially those that are uh, rather high pH uh, and, and can cause chemical burns. So make sure that you read the label on any product that you're using that that's labeled for such applications. And uh, you can work with your, uh, you probably work with a chemical provider that provides you cleaning and sanitizing products. Uh, Work with them to select the best, most effective, and safe products for your facility. Uh, Another question here related to drains. Um, Would baking soda be an effective uh, preventative measure, I guess, when it comes to keeping drains clean? Not really. Uh, Baking soda itself is very mild in its action. And it would certainly require that the drain have absolutely no soil load uh, to provide any sort of benefit. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend uh, baking soda. And again, be careful of chemistry that you're putting down the drain. Whatever you select, some of it won't be compatible. If you put bleach and baking soda in the same drain, you're going to get a nasty chemical reaction. So uh, make sure you're selecting something that is intended for use. So if you've got a drain cleaner, foaming drain cleaners work great because they coat all the sides. Uh, they do tend to be caustic, uh, sometimes requiring gloves and goggles. So read that label very well and make sure what you're using in that drain is intended for that use. And there may be municipalities that do not allow certain types of materials to go down that drain, including enzymatic cleaners. So be sure you understand the rules in your municipality as to what you can put down that drain or are not supposed to. Great. Are there documented cases of fruit flies causing foodborne outbreak in restaurants? No, I, I covered this at the very beginning. You probably missed that. Um, they, uh, they are not, uh, they've not been linked directly to any foodborne outbreak. It's pretty hard to do that with any pest, although it has been shown with cockroaches and house flies and in some cases rodents. But for fruit flies, we just deduce that they can because of where they're breeding and feeding and as demonstrated in this presentation, how quite capable they are of uh, moving those materials around. Is it possible to estimate how many flies would need to be present in an area in order to start seeing you know, fly specks or, or noticeable levels of fruit flies? Yeah, fly spec, you're going to need a lot of flies. So it would be very obvious to you that you have a fly problem without even seeing the fly spec because that, that picture I showed you uh, was from an infestation that was very extensive and went on for a very long period of time. And some of these markings will last for years after, even after the flies have gone away. I'd say where you start to have your customers waving uh, the flies away at the bar or uh, just uh, basically seeing them in the customer areas is where you really need to do something about them. We're all going to have low levels of these flies in our facilities from time to time. 
but it's when they take up house and they found an area that's particularly attractive. Bars are particularly attractive because of the fermented materials and just the fact that they're attracted to those materials in the first place. So they tend to see them first, uh, and then if we've got some cleaning practices going on in the back of the house, uh, you're likely to see them there before you see them out in the customer areas. But once they get into the customer areas, it, it really needs to be taken care of. A couple more questions here. Uh, since fruit flies may come into a restaurant on produce, um, does uh, simple rinsing or a simple cleaning of the produce address potential con contamination problems? It can. It can uh, help, help with that. But once the egg is laid within the fruit or the onion or what have you, then uh, washing will not help with that. So it's good to maybe, if you have a cleaning practice, bring produce in. I think that's great. Uh, but in terms of once they're in the facility, uh, cover it and cover it uh, either with the right mesh screen materials if you want air circulation or, or cover it with a plastic lid. Is a quat sanitizer uh, the best product to use on beverage lines where flies may become an issue? Yeah, if it's labeled for such applications, <coughs> quat sanitizers, what they will do is they're very good at attacking the sugar snakes. And those, so those are the breeding sources. Um, and uh, a good physical cleaning first, physical cleaning by, I mean, removing that food debris, whether you're using water pressure to do it or brain brush, uh, uh, brain brush, drain brush, and, uh, and then, you know, scrubbing that out, getting it clean, and then following up with a, a, a labeled sanitary, uh, it has to be proper parts per million by label, uh, will will help very much with that. It'll help eliminate the, the food source that the fruit flies breed on. John, a couple of sugar snake questions for you. Uh, okay. One, how is a sugar snake created, and how far down the drain can it go? Well, uh, I have not seen them in the floor drains, how far down they can go, but I know they're very common up at the top. And what it is, it's a, it's a slime, basically, that's produced by a bacteria. There's different species of Pseudomonas and such that can do this. Some are pathogenic, some are not. And they produce this slime layer that protects the bacteria. It turns out this slime layer, or sugar snake, is also protective to the fruit fly eggs and the larvae, as well as serves as a food source. Now in drain lines, and I've even seen it in drain lines from ice machines, uh, these sugar snakes can be very long, a series of 10 or more feet in these drain lines. So very, very long sugar snakes that we've flushed from drain lines, whether it can be from the beer tap or from a beverage dispenser or from even a, 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 an espresso maker or coffee, coffee machine uh, are capable of producing very long sugar snakes and being, being big sources of these small flies. John, a question for you regarding temperatures. Is it possible for small flies to reproduce at a faster rate in, in higher or hotter temperatures? They have an optimum temperature between 70 and 80 degrees Fahrenheit, and that's about the, going to be the, the fastest that their life cycle can move. Above that, they're going to start to get stressed because of the heat. So we start getting temperatures of 90 degrees Fahrenheit, or that starts to get a little warm for them. Uh, and then when you start getting uh, to temperatures that are below 60 degrees Fahrenheit, that starts to get quite chilly for them, and their, their development will slow down. Below 55 degrees Fahrenheit is when many insect species just completely shut down and they don't uh, reproduce or move around very much. What can a restaurant do if they have, uh, if, if they're currently experiencing a fly infestation? What are, the, what are the first steps that should be taken? Well, what I would do is I would, uh, uh, you know, definitely partner with a pest management provider because you want to get the species nailed first. Uh, it's probably fruit flies, that's going to be the most common, but if you're dealing with forward flies, that's more problematic. The source of that can be very difficult to find, and it could indicate something very serious is going on. So I would, first of all, think about getting your pest management provider out there to perform an inspection. And then, as a manager of a restaurant, walk around, uh, dig, be a digger. Uh, it's okay to get down on your hands and knees and look under that cook line with a flashlight and uh, grab your staff to look down there with you so you can show them what it is that needs to be cleaned. People are tired at night after the shift, 
and uh, the cleaning can sometimes be cut short because the staff is, is I used to work uh, as a teenager in a restaurant. I knew how tired I was in the evening, and if I was on cleaning duty, sometimes corners got cut. So um, take them around and, and have high expectations for cleaning. Nobody leaves until that floor is spick and span. And I've had restaurant managers that totally turn the whole situation around just simply because they're more strict with the youth and make sure that uh, we're doing our jobs. So um, make sure you're, you're, you're doing your due diligence as a restaurant manager to, to inspect. Uh, just like uh, go around with your pest management provider and come up with a checklist. Come up with a checklist of things that should be cleaned on a nightly basis, things that should be cleaned on a weekly basis. Uh, put a wish list together and stick to it because these little flies will get in, take advantage of, of any situation that's left uh, unnoticed for some time. Great. And, John, we have time for one last question here. What okay. can be done to keep fruit flies from being stagnant on walls where there is no presence of fruits, syrups, or vegetables? Well, they have a natural behavior to just do that. Uh, for whatever reason, they are more restful during the day, and their high peak activity of moving around, mating, and eating tends to be more in the morning and the evening hours. Uh, so... It's pretty hard to change that behavior. There aren't really any repellent materials we have for fruit flies today. It's a great question. There are fruit fly monitors and fruit fly traps that the, your pest management provider can put out for you. Uh, they're not a solution, but they will help to reduce the adult population in certain areas until the source can be cleaned up. Uh, so these are typically called fruit fly monitors or fruit fly traps. They tend to have a way that the fruit fly can get in but can't get out. They can be captured in light traps uh, as well, but of course you can't put light traps everywhere. So work with your pest management provider. If there are walls that they are frequenting, there might be some insecticide placements that that pest management provider can place. But again, they need to be labeled for that fly and they need, need to be labeled for the site of application. Great. Uh, everyone, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for, for this month's webinar. Uh, John, thank you for your time and for the information that you were able to provide us. Uh, everyone, I hope you found the webinar valuable, and we hope that you'll join us next month. The food safety webinar will be held the third Tuesday of August, as it is every month, on August 21st. And expect an invitation to come out to you via email the week of August 13th. And we hope to see you on August 21st. Again, thank you for joining us today. And, John, thank you for your time. It was my pleasure. Thank you, everybody.